Okay, hey guys, um, really quick before I get to the rest of the presentation. Um, so tonight, what we're going to be doing with Fiveable is that we're going to choose two MVPs from tonight's stream to get like a bunch of Fiveable swag, like a t-shirt and stickers and like a bunch of pins. And so the way that you get picked is to like participate, ask questions, answer questions, and just overall make sure that you're participating within like the entire stream so you have a chance at actually getting chosen to be one of the MP MVPs. So, hi Ashley, hi Katie, hi Brandon. We'll just get like right to it. Um, so the reason why I joined Fiveable was because I think it's super important as like AP becomes like more and more accepted across the country that everyone has access to materials to prep them for the AP exam. Because if colleges are taking that as credit for their courses, then everyone should have a shot at actually getting a three passing or even getting a higher score, like a lot of the people who use Fiveable to study actually do. So that's why I joined the team. So tonight's stream is going to be Federalist 10, 51, and Brutus 1. So hi, my name's Fatma. I'm gonna be hosting tonight's stream. Uh, follow Fiveable on all of their social media. They're at Think Fiveable on Twitter and on Instagram and on YouTube. So it's pretty standard across all of their platforms. So now when you look towards the upcoming AP government streams, there's a lot happening next week. And right now, Nicole Johnston is hosting one after I finish up. So that's another one to look forward to. Yeah. So about me, my name's Fatma, like I said, I'm a senior this year and I live in Houston. And yeah, it's raining a lot, so that's a thing. Um, I do debate and I went to DC this summer. So all within the realm of actually um, doing government related stuff. Uh, yeah, I think we're all just surviving, Katie. Okay. So before we actually dive into all of the meat of this stream, let's like, what are y'all's opinions? Like, what do you guys know about the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist papers? So feel free to like say it in the chat because like, yeah, that's what we're going to be using to answer questions. Okay, so Katie says that the Federalist Papers were written by Madison. Uh, yeah, some of them were written by him. Uh, they were published in newspapers and debated. Uh, they were also promoted the ratification of the Constitution um, and opposed them going either way. Um, and so Ashley also says that Federalist 10 is about majority rule versus minority rights. So yeah, you guys are completely right. The Federalist and the Anti-Federalist papers were pretty much how they debated whether or not the Constitution should be rat ratified within the public sphere. So pretty much what they were aiming to do was either if they were the Federalist papers, convince everyone that the Constitution should be ratified. And if they were the Anti-Federalist papers, convince people that it should not be ratified. And so we're gonna get into the reasons why they said them, like right now, actually. <laughs> so yeah, like I said, strong government, Federalist Papers, ratification. And the anti-Federalist Papers were written to argue against the ratification and the, U the US Constitution. So the reason why I put the join or die, um, like very iconic, picture is because it pretty much, if they were arguing against the ratification, was saying that they should have 13 separate state confederation governments and like, yes, be together in that they were one country, but the state should have way more power. So that's why I put that cartoon. <laughs> okay. So yeah, like I said, the ideology, the Federalists wanted a strong federal government in the Constitution, which was being used to create that government. And the Anti-Federalists wanted a state government or 13 separate state governments that had more power than any federal government. So whatever they decided would reign supreme. So now that like we have that basis, let's like understand the background in the context for why this debate was happening. So 
In order to prevent a tyrannical government, the Articles of Confederation were put into place. And so that was the government that we had during the American Revolution. And post-revolution, people started realizing that there were a lot of issues with this amount of decentralized power because the federal government couldn't tax anyone. And that meant that they couldn't actually enforce any laws and in cases of rebellion, like when we look towards Shays' rebellion, they were unable to step in and help the state governments stop that political violence from happening. So people started realizing that the federal government needed a little bit more power. And so the Articles of, Federa of Confederation gave the federal government pretty much no power. And so it was very dysfunctional and it just wasn't working. So that's why they called for the Constitutional Convention. And so that was. That happened from May to September of 1787, which was after the American Revolution ended. And the initial like idea of the Constitutional Convention was just to revise the Articles of, Con of Confederation. They weren't actually aiming to write the Constitution. That's just what ended up happening um, because they just wanted to fix the flaws within the Articles of Confederation. And so that obviously is not what happened. Uh, so. Do you guys know who wrote most of the Federalist Papers? Because it wasn't just James Madison, like someone said before. Um, it was three different people. So everyone seems to know that it was Hamilton, maybe because of the musical, but I won't, I won't sponsor this one. Okay, so for some more historical context, who were the authors of the Federalist Papers? The first was Alexander Hamilton. So he was actually the one who initiated the efforts to actually write the Federalist Papers. He's pretty much the guy who got the team together. And so he also ended up being the first treasury secretary. Uh, that's kind of very important to the rest of American government, but we're not gonna like get into that. Uh, the other guy who was super important was John Jay. And he was the first chief justice of the United States. And so, it's pretty interesting that all of these people that had a lot of, like were in seats that had a lot of federal power were also very strong advocates for those seats having federal power. And so the last guy, James Madison, he was our fourth president and the two Federalist papers that we're going to be talking about today are both written by him. So Federalist 10, this, the thesis of this entire Federalist paper is factions are really bad for democracy and James Madison really wanted to stop them. So what it was actually titled was the utility of the union as a safeguard against domestic faction and insurrection. But we call this one Federalist 10 because that would be a very long title to repeat every single time we wanted to refer to it. Um, so James Madison wrote this because he was very scared of political factions causing violence and having a majority or a minority. And so the thing to know about factions is that they're just a group of people. They can be like the majority population of a country or the minority population of the country. It's not really important which one they are, but it's super important to know that they're also very normal for humans to have. Like we disagree with people on a lot of things. So it makes sense that we form factions with people that we like agree with, right? Because when you think back to early America, some people were living in New York in areas where there was a lot of business and other people's were, people were living in Virginia where there was a more farming economy. So it might make more sense for people in Virginia to want tariffs and people in New York to not want tariffs because that was just how their interests ended up being shaped based on where they lived and what their jobs were. So it's very normal for factions to exist. What James Madison was worried about though was that these factions would cause political violence and instability. And so the way that that would happen, and this is like a quote from the actual Federalist paper, was that factions would be brought together by quote, some common impulse of passion, other interest, adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. And so what that translated into normal English now is that these factions would have some kind of very passionate interest that they were invested in making sure that 
was made into law across the country. And so what they would do is take political power and pretty much enforce that interest. And that could be problematic when it comes to the rights of other people, because if your common interest is, is maybe, for example, saying that nobody could speak out against any businesses, farmers might suffer. And so that's why James Madison was super worried that that would happen because America was way smaller. And so it would be a lot easier for like a group of people to wreak havoc within the political system. And so that would be really bad for the government because then people couldn't trust within it because it would just be dominated by people's interests that they were passionate about. And it wouldn't actually represent the people. It would take away the people's rights and it would actively work against their interests. So that's why James Madison was very, very hesitant when it came to factions being created within the American government. And so it would also mean that the government could be scapegoated for pretty much anything, because if people don't agree with the government on one thing, then they can pretty much just extrapolate from that and make the government into a scapegoat for whatever is happening. So obviously that wouldn't make for a very effective government. So it was a pretty worrying idea. And so questions, do we have any factions today? Like factions are just groups of people that have a common interest. So what are some factions that we have since you guys all seem to say that we do have factions? Yeah, like political parties, like people who are representing like a specific group, group like for example, LGBT rights, yeah. Democrats, Republicans, they're political factions. They're groups that are representing like specific ideologies and people are super passionate about them. So what James Madison wanted to make sure didn't happen was Democrats or Republicans like separately being able to take over the entire government and impose whatever they wanted onto everyone because that would be very dangerous for representation and for democracy and that was exactly what um like the american people were trying to escape so moving on it pretty much seemed like to james madison that there was absolutely no way to stop factions without taking away liberties and so the only two ways that he really saw to completely eradicate the causes of factions was to either take away everyone's liberty and make sure that they couldn't really enforce or say what their like uh, ideas were. So that would obviously be completely counterintuitive to the entire idea of the American dream and and or like the American Revolution, like the founding fathers, James Madison, all of them literally fought for everyone's right to like be able to criticize the government. Oh, hi, Megan. Glad you joined us. Um, but yeah, back to what I was saying. Um, they could, so potentially they could take away their liberty, but then that would be doing the exact opposite of what America was intended to do. Or the other option was everyone could have the exact same opinions. That, so yeah, that technically would be a solution to having factions, but like, it's not feasible in literally any way, unless you like brainwashed everyone. And even then you would be violating their liberties. So taking away everyone's opinions or making them have the exact same opinions isn't an effective solution to factions. So destroying liberty, this is another quote from Federalist 10, would be a cure worse than the disease itself. And that's when he's like pretty much saying that like, taking away people's liberties is just way worse than destroying factions. So he understands that there's no way to stop factions completely without taking away people's rights. So James Madison in all his genius came to a solution and that solution was represent, res, representative democracy. So in Federalist 10, he talks about why a Federalist or a representative democracy would be way more beneficial to America than a popular government slash direct democracy. So this is reflected in the Constitution, in the House of Representatives, in the Senate. So 
The difference between a representative and a dire direct democracy, um, just for a primer for everyone, is that a direct democracy, literally every single citizen gets to vote on every single issue. So everyone has a vote when it comes to any bill. There's pretty much no House, no Senate. You're all your own representatives. But alternatively, in the House of Representatives and in the representative democracy, people come together and they vote for a representative. And so there's obviously people who are vying in elections to become that representative, but the people have a choice in who ultimately represents them in Congress or the legislature. So that's what a representative versus direct democracy is. And so the reason why James Madison thought that we shouldn't have a direct democracy is because they're very much characterized by the majority party and or like the majority interest dominating. And so that makes it very difficult to guarantee the rights of whoever person, whichever group or persons make up the minority. Because think about it, if 80% of a like population agrees with one thing and the other 20% disagrees, it's very likely that in a direct democracy, the 80% would win out, regardless of whether or not it was actually the best thing for the country. So the idea behind a representative democracy was that any factional passion would be balanced out first by like one passion not being able to spread from one state to another because representatives are the ones in charge of making decisions, but also because it was less likely that people would actually try to spread whatever their opinions were if only representatives were the ones in charge of making those decisions, but also because sectional leaders would have disagreements. So what sectional leaders and sectionalism, what that means is that specific areas of the country have different interests. So the way that we talked about this a lot in APUSH or AP US history was that the South had interests and they liked tariffs and they liked slavery. And the North was more of an industrial economy and they didn't like slavery. And so those are like examples of sectional agreements. So leaders of different like sections of America would just have natural disagreements. So that factional passion would just be diffused into just debate within a representative democracy. So at the end of the day, people ended up like repping federalism. Representatives would be completely responsible of representing the common interests, not just their own. That's one of the advantages that James Madison argued because if we went to the polls every single time there was an issue, it's likely that everyone would just think about themselves and not about the common interests when they voted. Alternatively, representatives would be charged with thinking about an entire population in, an, in the area, but also on a larger scale about whether or not an issue was the best for the entire country. And so that could also be checked because people could be elected out of office. And so another thing that was really important to James Madison was that people have feasible platforms when they run. They shouldn't promise more than what can be delivered. And so that was another reason why he was super passionate about having a representative democracy, because any leader in society would actually have to have something that is possible, because if it wasn't, people could just elect them out the next time. And so on top of that, a larger republic would mean more competing interests. So the more representatives from across the country that there were, the more interests that they would have to balance out. So it also is another thing that made factionalism less likely. So that was obviously the entire thesis of Federalist 10. We don't like factions and we need to prevent them in any way possible. And so the last thing was it would make it less, it would make it harder for people to have corrupt elections. So the reason how that would work is because if you have 10 people voting in an election, you can give everyone 10 bucks, call it a day, and probably get the vote. But if you have 10,000 people, giving everyone $10 becomes a lot harder financially, but also it's just less feasible because you can't exactly line everyone up and give them 10 bucks. So it made elections less corrupt. So that was pretty much how we solved the question of representative versus direct democracy. So what do you guys think that the impact of Federalist 10 was? How do we see it reflected in society today?
this question is a lot like the question where we talked about if we have modern factions. So I just want to know if you guys think that Federalist 10 had any influence on the way America is governed now. Uh, so someone says it established how we vote and how the government is organized. Yeah, so it didn't exactly establish it. It just argued that this is the way it should be. And so technically the constitution established it, but yeah, you're right. Um, Jonathan says we only really have two dominant parties. Yeah, so that's actually kind of right. Like one of the issues that James Madison wanted to prevent ended up being reflected in society. Like we too have two major factions and they have to compete every election to balance out interests. And if people don't agree with a faction at some point, that faction gets elected out and we have Democrats in office. But then the next cycle, we might have Republicans in office. So people can choose whether or not their interests are being represented. represented. Ashley says that minority rights aren't taken away because of majority rule. Yeah, that's actually super important. And it was one of the main reasons why James Madison wanted to make sure that factionalism didn't take over America. Uh, Brandon says that it shows that a representative republic is better at combating factionalism than a direct democracy. Yeah, because we want to make sure that people aren't being ignited by passions that aren't exactly accurate because sometimes, like think about it this way. If you see a video that goes viral on Twitter and it's been spread across a bunch of different people and you bring it up and you're like, hey, did you guys see that video? And then someone tells you that it was fake. It's very difficult to go back and take back every single person that saw that video and make sure that they understand that the video was fake. So yeah it's easier to make sure that representatives have correct information than it is to make sure that literally everyone in the country has that same information uh sammy says that we have the electoral college and two senators per state yeah that's true we do have that <laughs> um so yeah those are some of the impacts of federalist 10 but the main thing i want you guys to take away is that James Madison in Federalist 10 wanted to make sure that we were able to balance the interests of the majority opinion and the minority opinion, and that no one's rights were taken away just because they were part of a faction or not part of a faction, because he thought they were incredibly dangerous for the American political system. Also, very ironically, when you look towards the fact that James Madison didn't like factionalism. He was one of the main leaders of um, the Democratic Republicans, which was a faction, essentially. It was a political party um, during that time in America. So yeah, we have a representative democracy. <laughs> That's the impact of Federalist 10. Okay, so now moving on to Federalist 51. Fun times. Okay, so Federalist 51 is pretty much about checks and balances and making sure that every branch of government is independent. And so this one, like I said earlier, is also written by James Madison. And it's titled, The Structure of the Government Must Furnish the Proper Checks and Balances Between the Different Departments. We're gonna call it Federalist 51. Okay, so he wanted to make sure that each branch of government was completely independent. So Unlike the Articles of Confederation, where the federal government didn't have any power, he wanted to make sure that in the new federal government, which hopefully would have power, power wasn't concentrated in only one area of that government. Because when we throw back to the American Revolution, the reason why the American Revolution was fought was because a branch of government was becoming tyrannical. And that branch of government was like just all of Britain, per se. So yeah, James Madison wanted to prevent tyranny by this time branches of the federal government and not factions. So the reason that we had Federalist 51 and the reason why James Madison wrote it was because he worried that one branch would dominate others. And so this would obviously lead to tyranny. And that was something that a lot of people were worried about because that's what happened during the American Revolution. So what he did through Federalist 51 was reassure that 
the American people, that there would be ways to make sure that the federal government did not become too powerful and that the federal government would be independent and unable to influence its different parts. So the, he was also worried that the government would be like dominated by the majority. And so the one way to make sure that governance for the common good happens is to make sure that every branch of government is independent and that it can actually check each other. So he also wanted to prevent corruption because something that could happen if financial power is concentrated within one branch, you could take away money if you wanted to, and you could also give it back if you wanted to. So in that way, you could have a lot of corruption because if someone agrees with you, you give them more money. If someone doesn't, you take it away. So power was divided a lot through like the constitution and the Federalist 51 explained how that happened and how it would be effective enough to prevent tyranny. So the state governments still had power. So one of the things that the Federalist Papers wanted to reassure everyone was that we wouldn't be going from this idea of 13 confederation, a confederation of 13 states to just one union and no one has any other say in government because state governments also like had power. So that's important to remember. They would be working together, not apart. So the legislative branch. So what James Madison considered the legislative branch to be was the true voice of the people. Because these people would be elected into office, they were the voice of the American people. They were who would be reflected in the interests that came forth and how bills were voted on and whether or not something actually became legislation. And so until the 17th Amendment though, direct which guaranteed direct elections for senators, a lot of times senators were chosen by state legislatures. So that's an interesting thing to know, to know. So the legislative branch is also divided into two different chambers. So even though that power is divided into three separate branches when it comes to the federal like branch, we also have two separate sub branches within that leg legislative branch. So that means that for a bill to actually become law, it has to pass in the House and in the Senate. So potentially the House could pass a bill and the Senate could be like, nah, and it wouldn't become law. Alternatively, the House could fail a bill and then there would just be no point of taking a vote on it in the Senate. So the important thing to note is that because this is a representative democracy, citizens can check the branch by electing their representatives. So if they decide that, you know what, we don't like Senator so-and-so, they're gone after the 17th Amendment had been passed. So how was the power of federal branches checked? A, we elect every person that works for the federal government. B, checks and balances. C, the Supreme Court flips a coin and decides which federal branch gets the most power in an issue. Yeah, the consensus seems to be that the answer is B, and it definitely is, because A, we don't elect every person that works for the federal government. Like, think about it. We have executive agencies. We don't elect the, we don't elect the, like, director of the FBI. We don't elect a lot of different people who work in the executive branch. That's important to remember. Uh, checks and balances. Yeah, that's what Federalist 51 is about. It says that the three branches of government should have independent powers and they should be able to check each other because that's one of the ways that we can make sure that no part of the federal government becomes tyrannical and seizes a bunch of power. And so see, the Supreme Court flips a coin to decide which federal branch gets the most power. Yeah, that just doesn't happen. I don't know what to tell you guys other than that. Okay, so now that we've reviewed what Federalist, there's a question in the question box. Oh, thanks. Okay, so someone asked about what state sovereignty is. So, okay, state sovereignty is the idea that every single state should be able to make its own decisions. So no one else should be able to encroach on to that state's ability to make its decisions. So 
in our government right now, for example, states do have a limited amount of sovereignty. Like we can make different laws regarding education. And so like the state government has control over what education laws that we have. But at the same time, states' sovereignty is limited by the federal government because if a state law violates a federal law, we have something called the supremacy clause, which means that the state law would be invalidated because the federal government said that it just isn't allowed. So state sovereignty means that people are allowed, the state government is allowed to do what it wants and it has the ability to make its own decisions without any other state interfering with it. So like, for example, if Texas decided that we would start learning about Pluto and that's the only thing we would learn about ever in science class, like Arkansas couldn't step in and be like, no, Texas, you can't do that because Texas has the ability to make its own laws regarding education. So that's pretty much what state sovereignty is. It's a state's ability to make its own laws without anyone interfering with it. And so obviously American states aren't completely sovereign because they're limited by the federal government, but to some extent they do get to make their own decisions. So I hope that answered the question. And if anyone wants to ask a follow-up, feel free to do that and I will get back to it as soon as I see it. So now I have a question for you guys. Um, what are some arguments that anti-federalists could use? Because obviously we know a lot of reasons why we have the constitution as it is, but what are some reasons that we might not want the constitution? So Ashley says that they could say that one branch might take over the others and become tyrannical. Yeah, like the Federalist Papers talk about why that might happen and how they would be preventing it. Um, Sandra says that large republics don't work because they're very diverse. Yeah, that also might be an argument because if there's a bunch of different interest groups, who's to say that the person that gets elected is actually representing everyone's interests? Um, so Allison says that the government can violate people's liber liberties. Yeah, that's also right. Like that's one of the things that the anti-federalists actually employed as a really big argument. So everyone, thank you for your answers. Uh, we're going to get into what Brutus One says now. Okay, so some background. The people who wrote Brutus One are not very well remembered in American history. One of them's name was Melanchthon Smith, and he was the New York delegate to the Continental Congress. And so that was during the Revolutionary War and the pre-Revolutionary War period. And so the other was John Williams. He was also based in New York and he was just a politician there. So Brutus I is the name of the Anti-Federalist Papers. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much what the Anti-Federalists want. They didn't want the Constitution ratified, and so they were rebutting the Federalist Papers and engaging with whatever the Federalist Papers said in order to prove that not ratifying the Constitution would be more beneficial to the Republic slash Confederation of States that existed in America back then. So Brutus won. What is a confederation of states? So a confederation of states is pretty much a bunch of different states that are in like a league of friendship with each other. So there's really no like federal authority governing what these 13 states do. They're just working together and they say that they're part of one nation. And so technically the federal government existed under the Articles of Constitution, but it didn't really have any federal authority. So that's what Brutus I and the Articles of Con Confederation were arguing for. Um, the Constitution, on the other hand, would take this League of Friendship where the 13 states got to make largely their own decisions when it came to taxation, when it came to troops, whether or not they wanted to give money to the federal government. And there would actually be a federal governing body that would be over all of those 13 states. And so if the 13 states violate, if one of the 13 states violated a law, the federal government would be able to take steps to enforce its ultimate authority. So Brutus I very much did not want that because like you guys said, they were worried about tyranny. And that was one of the hugest things that worried the authors of Brutus I. So their idea is that federal power is bad and it's dangerous. And it says the constitution gives too much power to the federal government. 
And so the two main ways that they explained why the Constitution was giving too much power to the federal government was first through the necessary and proper clause. Everyone's going to get into more detail about this as you like dive into like the actual Constitution. But what you need to know is that the necessary and proper clause says that the federal government can make laws that it deems necessary. So it pretty much means that if the federal government wants to solve a problem, it's allowed to make a law to solve that problem. So it's kind of a lot of vague area where the federal government would be allowed to like make different laws that might end up being tyrannical is what Brutus one argued. And the supremacy clause says that federal law supersedes state laws. So you guys are also going to learn about a few different Supreme Court cases that really cemented this into like modern constitutional law. But it said that states don't have the power to disagree with the federal government. And so when you think about where first we have the Articles of Confederation, and there's this league of 13 different states, and they're all friends, but they don't have to adhere to anyone's rules outside of their state legislature. Having all that power taken away and given to a federal government that could potentially change laws that people wanted in a state, people in like these 13 different states didn't want that. And Brutus One was trying to capitalize on that idea, saying that your power and your like rights are going to be taken away by the federal government. So another thing that Brutus One argued is that because America was growing, a representative democracy would only make this elite group of people that would lead the country and power would be concentrated within that group of people. And so even though these people were technically being elected, they wouldn't actually be representing the interests of the common man. And so because the country was getting even bigger, we were adding more states and expanding into the West, representative democracy just wouldn't work because certain people wouldn't be represented in the correct way and their views wouldn't be represented as accurately as they could be. So there would be a lot of inaccurate representation. So someone asks, do we still have the necessary and proper clause and, and the supremacy clause? And so the answer to that is yes, we do. Because yeah, like I said, the supremacy clause is pretty much saying that federal law supersedes state law. So if a state makes a law and the federal government makes a law that like um, invalidates that, a lot of times like at the bottom of the federal law that's being passed is that there will be some like text that says all other laws that are in conflict with this are now null and void. So for example, if the federal government passes a law that says that Texas is now part of Arkansas, Arkansas, then if Texas had a law that said Texas is not a part of Arkansas, that state law would now be invalidated by the supremacy clause. So both of those two clauses are still part of the constitution because that's how the constitution was ratified. And so they're both still used and they're still like part of the constitution. Okay, so feel free to ask a follow-up if that wasn't clear enough, but yeah, that's pretty much the gist of those two clauses. And so Ashley is asking in the chat that didn't the Federalists want a semi-elitist government? And so while that is true, in some cases, some of the Federalists did want an elitist government. Like for example, Alexander Hamilton, who was one of the people who was a member member of like the Federalist papers, like technically did argue for what was practically a monarchy. The Federalist papers as a whole were not saying that they should have a monarchy the federalist papers were just arguing that the constitution should be ratified so they weren't really saying anything other than the constitution is good this is why we need more federal power yeah so i hope that clears that up so yeah some federalists did want a semi-elitist government others didn't it was just that they were mostly saying that the constitution is good so yeah Brutus I was saying that the government could quickly become tyrannical. So at the end of the day, who won that ideological battle? The Federalists won, or the Anti-Federalists, or did we all win the ideological battle? Okay, a lot of people are saying C, and I'm pretty much like sure that Partly, it's because it's a reference to the Victoria Justice meme. 
but I'm also not completely sure if that's true. So yeah, technically the correct answer is A, but I could see why you guys chose C, not only for the meme, but also because like Ashley says, like Ashley and As Allison say, and Sim says in the chat, it, we did compromise at the end of the day. The Federalists like actually did decide that, you know what, you guys are right. We do need something that makes sure that the federal government doesn't become too powerful. Because if we're making this entity that has more power than the Articles of Confederation gave to the American government, then we need some way to make sure that it can't get out of hand because we fought the American Revolution. Like, we know what too much power looks like. It looks like silencing people who disagree with you, dissent being quashed by military force. It means violating people's rights. So, it means that, yes, we do need the Bill of Rights. So, Zoe, you're right. Um, like a lot of you guys said, they made sure that if the Constitution was ratified, we would also pass a Bill of Rights. And that Bill of Rights would guarantee that no one's liberties and like essential freedoms could be violated by anyone else so yes we did all win at the end of the day but technically the federalists mostly won that battle too okay so what do i want you guys to take away from this the federalists did be were successful in that they convinced the country that a federal government was needed and that it could also be controlled so the constitution was ratified in part because these Federalist Papers were written to convince people that a government in the Constitution were actually successful and had the potential to be better for the country than the Articles of Confederation were. And so the Articles of Confederation also set the stage for a stronger federal government because we knew what it looked like when the Articles of Confederation had a federal government that couldn't tax people. It was ineffective, it was weak, and any time we wanted to actually hold power on the global stage, it didn't work because the federal government wasn't uniting everyone together in terms of common interest. So, yeah, at the end of the day, the Constitution was ratified. The Federalists got what they wanted. The Anti-Federalists also gave, got what they wanted because they got the Bill of Rights. Uh, so Kaya asked, could you give a short summary of Federalist 51 again? And yeah, I will also go back to it so you can look along as I explain. So um, the idea behind Federalist 51 was saying that all three branches of government uh, were like, they needed to be independent. And so those three branches couldn't interfere with each other's decisions. So one of those examples is that the president can appoint people that will run executive agencies like the State Department, but he can't decide who gets to be a representative within Congress, like this, the people in the legislatures do. And at the same time, Congress can't decide who has, like who ultimately gets chosen to be a, um, representative or an ambassador in the State Department, even though they do get to like decide whether or not the person actually gets to hold the position. Um, they do, they don't get to choose who that person is. The president technically appoints them. So Federalist 51 was saying that federal power shouldn't be concentrated within one branch. It should be divided within all three. So yeah, Allison, it was sort of like checks and balances. That was pretty much the main idea of Federalist 51. So Ashley asked, just out of curiosity, how many anti-federalist papers were written? So I'm pretty sure, like I'm 99% sure that it was either 12 or 13. Um, yeah, there weren't a lot of them, like compared to the federalist papers where there was like 51 written by Alexander Hamilton, five written by John D Jay, and 29 written by James Madison, like the anti-federalist papers were kind of slacking. Uh, they weren't doing so great. Um, Zoe asks, uh, is checks and balances the same as the idea of separation of powers? Um, so separation of powers is the idea where like all three branches are going to have like different duties and that no branch could interfere with each other. But checks and balances says that we can't let that power get out of hand. So whereas like checks and balances means that the president can veto a law that Congress passes. Separation of powers means that only Congress gets to decide funding. 
and Congress passes bills that decide whether or not the president can like use money for different departments. Like it decides proportionment. So they're not the exact same, but they're very similar, like Ashley said. So if you need more clarification, I can go into more detail, just like say it in the chat or like click the ask a question tab because they are like concepts that are very similar in nature and like sometimes it can get a bit confusing. Okay, so Zoe says thanks. Uh, no problem, Zoe, I got you. That's why I'm here. Okay, so I'm just gonna like put it on the takeaways slide. And so if you guys have any more questions, like ask them in the chat and I'll just wait a minute or two for like any to come in and then I'll sign out. Oh, thanks guys. I do it because I love AP government. Um, so everyone can get a five on their AP test. Yeah. Oh, Sim has a quiz tomorrow. Wow. Um, good luck. I hope this helps. Uh, okay, so someone asked if I could explain Federalist. I'm assuming 10 because it just says one again. And so Federalist 10 was the, oh, Brutus 1. Sorry, I read that wrong. Um, Brutus 1, which I will go to on the slides, is pretty much a anti-Federalist paper. So like in very likely within the AP test, like just a note, it, you'll see like either Federalist 10, like if you do see it, like it'll be announced as Federalist 10, but the anti-Federalist papers sometimes are called like Brutus 1. So the Brutus 1 said, that the constitution shouldn't be ratified because it would like end up being tyrannical. And so it was saying that like the federal government had too much power. And so the two like specific parts that it cited was the necessary and proper clause and the supremacy clause. So yeah. Um, yeah, I can go into more detail about that like Brutus one was pretty much just saying that like having this much federal power would be bad for like democracy and it would take away people's rights because states wouldn't be able to have their different laws and the federal government could just invalidate their laws. So Brandon asked, are we going to announce the MVPs? Um, not right now, but I will like actually get back to everyone. You'll probably receive an email and like, because you guys all like logged in to Crowdcast with your emails, um, you'll just like be contacted. And so, yeah, we might have to do some deliberation because everyone was super great and super active in the chat. So like, thanks to all of you for doing that. The decision's very hard. Any more questions? Okay. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, if you have, oh, okay. Jonathan says one more. I got you. Don't even worry about it, Jonathan. Oh, so Jonathan asked the FRQs, is this likely to show up? Um, okay. So I don't know it off the top of my head, but I know that you can go check College Board for like how much of each section of content will be like tested on the exam. So Foundations of American Government, I'm like 99% sure, like they make up not a huge part. And so this counts within like documents and foundations. So like I don't make any promises because I don't have the like rubric memorized off the top of my head. But if you check like the part where there's like the different like 10% of like political socialization, like you'll be able to check pretty much. Like it didn't show up in, in my experience with practice tests. So that's true. Okay, yeah, feel free to check. Um, 
So Zoe asks, were the anti-federalists against the government interfering through traditional means too? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by traditional means, but the anti-federalists were pretty much against like federal power superseding like state power in a way that like took away the state's abilities to make its own aut autonomous de decisions. So like, if that answers your question, that's great. But if not, like, feel free to ask a follow up. Okay, it looks like that is all the questions that you guys have for today. If you have any more, like ask them now or for, for oh, okay. Traditional meaning law enforcement, public property. So um, anti-federalists didn't want the federal government be, being able to like potentially like take troops and like use them against states that disagreed. So like they were against the federal the federal government being able to take away people's like rights and like public property using things like law enforcement. So yes, I think the answer by what you mean through traditional means is yes. Like the anti-federalists just didn't want like the federal government to be able to like take away the things that were inherent to human rights, like the natural rights when we talk about them, right? Like life, liberty, property. Okay, so I think that's the last question. There don't seem to be any more flowing in. So thank you for everyone who tuned in today. We'll contact you about the MVPs. I hope all of you have a great night and do great on the AP government exam. So tune into our streams in like the coming weeks and the coming days. We'll help get you ready for both class and for that exam in May. Thank you for tuning in. Bye-bye. Have a good night.